Hi guys and welcome to the second tutorial in my series on the solar growth model. In the last lesson we discussed what the solar growth model actually was and what it represented. In today's tutorial we'll be looking at how to derive those curves mathematically. Just to point out, I would also always recommend to like my Facebook page to stay up to date with all the latest economics tutorials. The link for that will be in the description box. So fundamental to forming this model is that we want to look at the assumptions. And the reason for this is that those assumptions help to simplify a complex economy into one which can be illustrated through three simple curves. So the first assumption is that we're in a closed economy. And the reason for that is that we don't have to worry about imports and exports. So that really simplifies our economy down because we're looking at output only being determined by inputs in our domesticated economy, those inputs being capital and labor. And that leads us on to our second assumption. There are only two inputs into the production function, capital, K, and labor, N. Thirdly, we're gonna have constant returns to scale in both inputs, but decreasing returns to scale in each of those inputs. So what that means is that, for example, when you add capital to the economy, you're going to have decreasing returns. When you add labor to the economy, you're also gonna have decreasing returns. But both of those combined gives you constant returns to scale. And that will become really clear in the next page when we're looking at how to derive the production function. So just bear with me on that one. And lastly, the size of the population and participation rates are fixed. And the reason for that is that we don't wanna worry about changing labor supplies and the complications that that brings. Okay, so we wanted to derive the production function. And again, we're gonna be using the assumptions and I've just written out here the two major assumptions that we'll be using. The first one is that there are two inputs into the production function, those two inputs being capital and the labor. And then we'll be looking at the constant returns to scale on both of those factors. So here I've written out the production function where Y output is equal to some factor of capital and labor. And then now, because we have constant returns to scale outlined over here, we can rewrite this as ZY is equal to some factor of Z multiplied by K, Z multiplied by N. And all that's saying is that if you multiply Y by some number Z, it's gonna be the same as multiplying K by Z and multiplying N by Z. So that's the basic idea of constant returns to scale. And that's actually really useful for deriving this production function over here. And the reason for that is that we can use this rule, but actually divide by N. So let's just divide by N in our production function. And we, can, and we know that since we've got constant returns to scale, we can actually do this mathematically. So we can write this as one over N K, one over N, N. Now you can see here that those two things actually cancel out. So we can actually write this as Y over N is equal to some factor of K over N, one. And actually what you'll find is this Y over N here that y over n can actually be simplified to output per person because we have the output of the economy divided by the number of people in the economy. So we can rewrite that as lowercase y, output per worker, and then we can write that as some factor. And instead of saying capital divided by n, we can just say capital per worker, and we can represent that with a lowercase k. So we're actually saying that output per worker is some factor of capital per worker. And that's exactly what we have in this diagram to your right here. Because we can show that we have capital per worker on the x-axis and output per worker on the y-axis. We also assumed in our model that there was decreasing returns to scale in each of the individual inputs to the production function. Hence, therefore, the production function takes this upward sloping curve as given. So now we're gonna move on to the investment function. 
Now the investment function, as you can see on this diagram here, is simply just a movement down of the production function. So how do we get at this production function? Well, we can use this equation here, and this says that output in the economy is equal to consumption, C0 being the amount of consumption that isn't dependent on income, C1 multiplied by Y is the amount of consumption dependent on income, I is equal to investment, G is equal to government expenditure. Because we assume that we're in a closed economy, we don't add in exports and imports into that. And that's just a simple model of aggregate demand that you should have learned in your macroeconomic courses before. We're going to assume also that government spending is equal to zero and consumption that isn't dependent on income is also zero. Now, I know that these assumptions are quite unrealistic, but this is economics and this is what we were told by the economists that we should assume. Essentially, this is a limiting assumption and it isn't that practical but it does give us an interesting result. So let's just write out our equation now then. So since we assume that C0 is equal to zero, we can get rid of this. And since we assume G is zero, we can also get rid of that. So then we can write this as Y is equal to C1 multiplied by Y plus investment. Rearranging this equation, we can therefore find that y multiplied by 1 minus c1 is equal to investment. Now, c1 is the amount of consumption you consume for every extra pound you're given. So 1 minus c1 would be how much money you save for every pound that you're given. So actually we can rewrite this as y multiplied by the savings rate is equal to investment. And then we can say, well actually let's find the investment per person. So let's just say that investment per person is equal to lowercase i. We can say that, that is equal to output per person multiplied by the savings rate. And therefore, we can rewrite this, the output per person as FK, as found over here. So we can write investment per person is equal to the savings rate multiplied by FK. The savings rate is how much income you save, and that's always going to be less or equal to 1. Hence, therefore, this s multiplied by fk is always going to be less than fk unless s is equal to 1, which is highly unlikely because you don't save all your income. So therefore, the investment function here is always lower down than the production function, but essentially it takes the same shape. And lastly, we want to add in the depreciation curve. And the depreciation curve is a very simple upward sloping straight line as so. The reason why it's upward sloping is that we assume that the amount of depreciation of capital is simply dependent on the amount of capital per worker that there is. Thanks for watching this tutorial. I hope you now understand how we derive the curves in this solar growth model and from the last lesson, understand what the Silo Growth model actually shows. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment and subscribe and follow my Facebook page for more updates on economics.